everyone, and welcome back to Ladies Lipstick and Litigation. I'm Janess Rutledge of Reinhardt Burner Van Duren, and I'm joined by my good friend who will introduce herself again. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Heidi Toll. I am an intellectual property attorney at Reinhardt Burner Van Duren with Janess. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about some March Madness cases that are going on. Um, Heidi, do you do any brackets yourself? I do, but I have never even come close to winning any sort of bracket competition. I think I probably hold the record for having the most off bracket of all time. And since then I haven't done one, so, <laughs> so you're ahead of me already. Um, so we're gonna talk today about a few trademark cases um, as well as the very closely watched antitrust matter that's currently pending in front of the Supreme Court. Um, so. In general, NCAA holds various trademarks related to the, the college basketball tournament that we're all very familiar with as March Madness. Um, but a lot of people don't know that the NCAA wasn't the first person or first entity to use the term March Madness. That was actually the Illinois High School Association, which we be began using the term March Madness to describe the high school, uh, the high school tournament, and they started using it in 1939. The NCAA, in turn, did not start using it until 1982. The ILHS, or excuse me, the IHSA um, and the NCAA actually did litigate who had the rights to use it in 1996, and the Seventh Circuit found that the IHSA could not control the term when it was used in conjunction with a college basketball tournament. But rather than fighting until the end of time, um, IHSA and NCAA, shortly after that litigation resolved, formed a joint entity called the March Madness Athletic Association, which manages and owns uh, the name and does licensing for the name. Um, the NCAA is pretty litigious when it comes to the use of the terms March Madness or anything that, that could be construed as, as talking about March Madness or any related things. Um, they won an argument in 2005 over a, a, an application in front of the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board related to the registration of MarchMadness.com. And it was argued at that time that March Madness was considered generic for a basketball tournament that took place in March. Um, it, they, they won that one, but they you know, are regularly in court um, are, are protecting their marks. They own a lot of trademarks that we've all heard, NCAA, March Mayhem, Elite Eight, Final Four. Um, funnily enough, they do not own Sweet 16. They actually licensed that from Kentucky High School Athletic Association who coined that term. Um, most of NCAA's trademarks that I mentioned are incontestable, which means that they have been registered for more than five years. Um, and funnily enough, maybe I should have asked you if you do a, a column or something, because NCAA claims rights to the term bracket in relation to, uh, or it claims rights to the brackets that go out for March Madness every year, um, and has filed oppositions related to terms like bracket attack and don't let one team bust your bracket. So maybe we should have called it a schmack it. I'm um, sorry, NCAA. So Heidi, you have a quick case that you want to talk about related to NCAA's trademark enforce or, or a related trademark matter. So why don't you take it away? Absolutely. And it's not surprising given how much NCAA March Madness is a huge thing in our society and our culture. We've seen, you know, the strength of the trademarks, the lengths to which they go to protect their rights, that other people would try to grab their own little piece of this. And actually, recently there was a case before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board where a person tried to register um, 40 0, which refers to essentially the perfect season in a regular season of basketball this past year it was shortened, but um, that would be like the perfect season of basketball. Um, actually, the University of Kentucky opposed it and the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board agreed with the University of Kentucky saying that 40-0 is an informational statement that anyone who is such a good basketball team that they do achieve that sort of record should be able to use 40 and 0 to refer to their amazing season. So the key takeaway is trademark rights you have to use them and have to actually be using them. It's not, you can't just 
apply to register a trademark and then own it. Um, and so in this case, that person found out the hard way. <laughs> so I can't do that. Yay, sports. Um, <laughs> let's talk more about sports so that's that's a great case and um I, I think it was Kentucky yes yeah they probably have come closer to being 40 and 0 than any team recently and um that's sad for our beloved Badgers I know but <laughs> actually it was uh because they had used the term 40 and 0 before their 2013 season in which they actually did achieve a 40 and 0 record so it's kind of seen as like we predicted the perfect season so um, while any team that achieves it can use it because that's an accurate description of a perfect season, um, it has special meaning for the University of Kentucky given that special season they had in 2013. Well, I, I only wish that our Badgers got a little bit closer to that this year, but you know, there's always next year. <laughs> um, so thanks for that summary. I am going to talk about what I think is probably the funniest case that I've seen in a while. Um, NCAA on March 12th filed a cancellation proceeding in TTAB over the term vasectomy mayhem. Y yes, you heard me correctly, vasectomy mayhem. Um, NCAA uh, alleged priority likelihood of confusion and dilution by blurring. Um, vasectomy mayhem actually was a registered mark. It was applied for in August of 2019. And it was chosen specifically because research shows that more men have vasectomies during late March um, and that appointments tend to spike in late March during the NCAA tournament when men can sit on their couch and recover from vasectomies. <laughs> Janice, this is um, true that people schedule minor medical procedures uh, so they can watch March Madness while recovering. And there's actually been cases where um, certain restaurants have provided um, longer seating or more comfortable, um, I guess, viewing seating for the purpose <laughs> of people sitting for a long time and uh, recovering while enjoying wings and a beer and watching March Madness. So it is uh, certainly a thing that occurs that who would have thought? Well, these doctors certainly wanted to take advantage of, of that um, and have made several applications or had, had applied before for vasectomy madness, which was rejected by the board. Um, NCAA is saying clearly that there's a likelihood of confusion that there's sponsorship or affiliation, not necessarily um, likelihood of confusion that the NCAA is providing vasectomy services, which would not be great. Um, and NCAA cited to you know, the failed registration for vasectomy madness cited to advertising that made reference to the NCAA and also uh, it has many references to a March tournament and basketballs and um, the NCAA also argued that the doctors tried to link themselves to the tournament it, through their advertisements further showing that they were attempting to establish some sort of um, sponsorship or affiliation and I have a little bit of I, I'll show you um, an example some of these so you should be seeing my vasectomy madness strikes again screen um there's hoops madness and the highlighting is what the ncaa had done um in their this is an exhibit to their ttab proceeding um so you can see that there's a bracket shown um lots of basketball references um even it even appears this in a similar font and and um color as as the march madness trademarks do uh, and you can see several several references to started as men could watch college basketball for three recovery days. Um, so there are many of these these kinds of references linking them specifically to March Madness. Um, so it's interesting. We'll see how it how it turns out. Um, it's still a pretty new case, so uh, not surprising that NCAA might not want to want consumers to think that they sponsor or are otherwise affiliated with a, vas a vasectomy mayhem. But or just missing work to watch games, even though they are pretty exciting. Yep, so that's that's my case. So we'll, we'll see where it goes. But I, when I first read it, I said, I, I okay, all right, vasectomy mayhem, here we go. <laughs> we certainly have not talked about that on this uh, show before. Uh, probably not again. But uh, 
that is the weird and wonderful world of trademarks and litigation. Um, even wild things can actually cause brand confusion or hurt a brand. And um, as the NCAA has shown, um, when it causes enough damage, um, parties are willing to litigate and actually spend money and time to protect their rights and protect their brand image. So I probably shouldn't come up with something next year called Smart Madness. Um, during we'll March. workshop it. <laughs> we have time. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so Heidi, our, our last case today, you're going to be talking about the very closely watched antitrust uh, litigation going on in front of the Supreme Court. Can you give us a summary of that case and what's going on? Absolutely. So this is a case that's been going on for a long while now. It actually started out as a class action lawsuit in 2014 and was heard by a federal district court in California. And essentially this case is asking whether limits on college athlete compensation violates antitrust law. So essentially it's the case related to whether or not players can be compensated for um, their being college, college athletes. Um, while most of us like to watch basketball games and Final Four is coming up, which is sure to be exciting, um, for lawyers who like to watch something different for entertainment, oral arguments before the Supreme Court were yesterday, um, which is where both parties get a chance to essentially argue and summarize a case that in this case has been going on for seven years, really distill it down to the main issues for the justices of the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court gets to ask questions. I'm sorry, um, I was just laughing at your reference, but attorneys love listening to oral arguments because we're such- Maybe not <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Um, I, I, sh, don't tell anyone, me too. <laughs> but so this one was really interesting, really exciting. I mean, people have been talking about this for a long time. Should college athletes be paid? The NCAA essentially made an argument that the appeal of college athletics is it, that it's an amateur league, that people love seeing that affiliation between the college, young people playing for a team, um, and kind of that pre-professional kind of, I don't know, connection or, you know, the community that surrounds a particular institution or university. Um, the justices had a lot of questions for the NCAA, particularly considering um, that television licensing alone for NCAA sports was over a billion dollars last year. Um, in, I believe, 39 states, the highest public highest paid public employees are college coaches. Um, and um, colleges stand to make a lot of money related to games, marketing, licensing, all these things around it. Um, however, the court had just as many questions um, for the defendant in this case asking, um, you know, what sort of restrictions would be in place? And if the court were to put restrictions in place, um, would this become a situation where the judiciary was unnecessarily involved in monitoring and kind of overseeing the business relationship in something that is already complex? And I believe one of the justices um, likened it to a Jenga game um, where college athletics is this a huge part of our um, community and kind of what our culture, um, you know, March Madness people, as Janessa said, are going to extreme lengths to watch these games. So if we start, you know, pulling apart pieces of it, um, how far do we go before it crumbles? Um, so it looks like there was a full court press, to use a basketball term, um, on both the plaintiff and or the appellant and the appellee in this case. And so it'll be really exciting to see how this one turns out. And Janessa, I think you and I will be excited, not only because it's an interesting case, um, antitrust is not necessarily something that we, the two of us focus on in our daily practice, but I'm thinking that this will have a lot of ramifications in the intellectual property world. As we've already talked about, we've talked about cases where college athletes um, can test whether or not their rights and likenesses, their images can be used in video games, um, you know, whether their photos can be used in promotions with or without their consent. Um, so if college players are compensated, I think the question will necessarily arise, 
are college athletes going to be compensated for the use of their likeness and image, which is uh, certainly something that colleges make money off of. So we will have to sit tight for a little bit. Um, it's looking like the Supreme Court might issue a decision this summer or fall, um, and we will report back to you when we get the decision. Awesome. Well, I'm very proud of you for that basketball pun. Sports. Um, well, <laughs> and thank you for that summary. Uh, thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Ladies Lipstick and Litigation. We'll have some fun sessions coming up on copyright parity and potentially some fun summer concert information. So uh, tune in and as always, feel free to reach out to us if there's anything you want to hear about or anything you want us to talk about. As you might be able to tell, we can talk about anything for a very long time. So please feel free to tune in and, and reach out to us and we appreciate you tuning in. Thanks so much, guys.